Thank you very much. Uh, and good afternoon, and thank you for coming uh, to hear my story. Um, it's my first time in Arkansas. Uh, I've been here just 24 hours, but I can already say that uh, I rewrote everything I was going to say. Because I, I thought that a made up presentation wouldn't serve right for something which uh, appeals so much to the heart and the warmth of what I experienced in just this one day here uh, from dinner in Doe's with my friend Beth Colson and his family and from seeing incredible artists like Robin Horner and uh, really I'm very very pleased and honored to be here in Little Rock uh, in Arkansas and I would like to share with you uh, a little brief um, history on what I've done and the things that today are somehow of I believe of importance and to share it with you. So I hope not to bore you too much. Um, well, uh, when I arrived, I realized we shared something and which is we come from the South, as I come from the South too, in this case, uh, the South of America, South America. <laughs> and I come from a city, uh, Santiago, Chile, where I was raised. Uh, which has five million uh, people living. Um, I come from a background of a father, doctor, uh, mother, nurse, and a full background in public service. Um, I'm an only child, sometimes you can tell. Um, my parents wanted to be a doctor. I, mm, I wasn't too okay with the blood, and I wanted to see the world, so uh, at the end, uh, I thought that the best I could do to follow somehow of my passion of uh, being an entrepreneur, of seeing things, was uh, to get out of Chile and the best way I could come to terms with it was a scholarship because I had no money to pay for it. Uh, so in 1996, I applied to a lot of schools in the US and I was very, very happy that uh, Stanford got me accepted. Um, I still believe they had a, some mistake in the computer and there was another Chang, Mr. Chang, <laughs> probably a Chinese gentleman with a very high cue, but I kept my mouth shut and got with the course. Um, uh, 1996 in Stanford was uh, quite a paramount year. It was the era, uh, if you can remember, of the dot-com boom. It was like the Klondike gold rush. Everyone wanted to be there. And uh, when I got the scholarship, everyone was congratulating me because they said it was the hardest scholarship to get in that year because for the first time, everyone was applying to Stanford and not to Harvard or Yale or Princeton or others. So uh, I, I believe I was very, very lucky. Uh, a few of you, of course, know that the following year, Chelsea Clinton arrived. And so it became even more, more uh, famous. And uh, it was a place where... Um, uh, somehow uh, I got the chance to discover not only another world but a free mind uh, thinking set of tools and uh, it was a, a moment in which um, a lot of people were having very bright ideas, uh, not me, uh, a lot of people were very offered a lot of jobs in companies like uh, eBay and Amazon, uh, not me, I didn't have a green card so I couldn't work. Uh, so I said, well, if I have a scholarship, it would be very of poor taste not to study. So I uh, did and uh, went into the MBA program and also uh, did behavioral sciences. So I studied three years, did summer school, and I had the chance while being in summer school to meet another guy who came from outside the United States who had this incredibly mad idea of putting this huge index on the internet, which at that point was a random database. Uh, at that point, it's also a moment in which Yahoo dominated the whole market. Uh, but I really, as I did then, and I do now, I somehow believed and invested in people and not in businesses or business plans. His business plan was literally dot matrix printed and this thick, full of algorithms I couldn't understand. Uh, the thing I'd see, I could understand it was that it was providing an effective search better than Yahoo and it, has cr it had crashed three times the Stanford server. 
So I said anything that can be able to crash Stanford server three times has to be the real thing. So I had $10,000 saved and my math in it was either buy a 1996 Mitsubishi Eclipse convertible, which is something I could afford, used of course, uh, it wouldn't do much for my social life in Stanford at that moment. Or then again, follow this guy whose name is Sergey Brin and invest in 1% of Google, which uh, today is funny, but at that time wasn't funny at all. Uh, the company incorporated just in 1998 and it became public in 2004. So let's say for the sake of the next eight years, I just had paper and no money. Um, uh, the dot com boom uh, somehow crashed, as you all know, in 1999. So I finished my MBA program and I was left with a very fancy diploma and no money and there was no company to work with. And I still thought that what I somehow had the passion to go through and to go through school, I should do more than just um, returning to, Sa to Santiago, to my hometown, and employ myself in a corporate job. Um, and it was at that time that I encountered uh, one book in 1999, which is uh, this book by Richard Branson called Losing My Virginity. I have to say that the title did appeal to me a bit. So, <laughs> so I read it very, uh, by the, the end of the year, and by the year 2000, I decided I was going back fueled by the passion of Richard to be an entrepreneur and all his mad stories about Virgin Records and all his record-breaking stunts. So when you are 25, you believe all that. And fortunately, I still believe in it. So in uh, 2000, I returned to Chile, uh, searching for my road to success with no money and no experience. And then I decided in 2001 to incorporate Grupo Arcano, and my vision was to be a social entrepreneur. And it's the mix of being in um, an MBA when you're an entrepreneur and being in behavioral sciences when you see public service, like we're here today, and when you see social sciences. And so this word, which was coined somehow in Stanford, I said, I really want to make a group of companies that invest in people and not just in business plans. And uh, well, of course, the beginning was were very rough and very hard. Uh, and um, I said, well, the basis of it would be one, innovation. We're going to invest just in innovative things, not only technology, but ways to solve common problems, services, things that are not just another copycat of the following company, but really bring some innovation. Also, uh, teamwork. Uh, and I know these words sound very uh, familiar to all of you, but then I believed even being an only child that, uh, and because of that, that I couldn't do it all alone. So I had to build a group together that could work together. And then I thought about the power of networking in which I believe all our friends here in the political scene know it very well, better than me. But networking ultimately uh, was a huge expander of whatever I had to say, whomever I had to see, or whatever I had to do. So um, it worked. It was 12 hours, 12 hours, sorry, 12 years of work. We expanded to the US, to the UK, and to Australia uh, till last year. And um, the results we've had has been 15 companies, uh, just in a nutshell, and my CPA can verify this for me. <laughs> we've had 15 companies. We have 790 employees. Last year, we had $1.8 billion in revenue and our average return has been 37% uh, per year. But this, only to see me at 39, this was last year, thinking that I've done already all the companies I wanted, but feeling still a little bit um, somehow empty. Of course, for the ones who uh, wonder about Google, yes, it was the year that Google also uh, went to over $1,000. Of course, my 1% was more than $10,000. Um, and of course, it helped. It would be um, r really lying not to say that. But um, uh, I felt that w I had to do more than just uh, keep investing in companies. So in 2008, when the financial crisis hit everywhere, 
um, and homes were taken away and we were growing with a lot of debt um, and we could pull out of disaster. Uh, basically, uh, by maneuvering all our resources, cutting jobs, putting our Google stock as collateral and trying to do the best, it was the point in which I survived that which was uh, a hit through the wall directly. And then I decided that I would do more than just investing in people in business, I will invest also in people in education. And so far from 2008 onwards, we've given uh, 78 full scholarships. This year we're going to give 100 uh, to children, kids coming out of school from all over the world, from the UK, from the US. We have people studying from arts to space uh, in universities like Cornell, Stanford, Harvard, University of Miami, uh, New South Wales in Australia, and so on. I have to say that, um, especially being in this school, that the aftermath of these five years, the last five, the result of it and the people we have helped has had a very, I would say, as a big effect as probably doing all these companies. Uh, there is so much money you can make, but there is not enough people you can touch. And we've been very, very fortunate to touch 78 people uh, for the best. And um, my, my pursuit followed a different path, as then my passion about what I was doing was reborn again. And I said, well, now what we're going to do is get this money and the money we have and put it into the universities where we are sponsoring and paying the tuition for all these kids. And what happened is that they were very gracious to us in offering their projects, the PhD projects for us to analyze and invest. Like when I started in, in Stanford with a PhD student in Stanford. And um, by the University of New South Wales in Australia, which were the ones that invented the solar panel, we developed a very large array of solar panels in Chile called Solar Chile that was acquired by First Solar. Might ring a bell because the largest investor is Christy Walton. Um, and we were acquired for $1.5 billion uh, last year. We also invested with the University of Cincinnati and Texas in a desalination technology that currently is desalinating in the British Virgin Islands as a prototype which will bring uh, water uh, at a twentieth of today's desalination cost by the use only of solar energy without any carbon footprint. And it has been possible, not really because of me, because of the very bright PhDs of all these universities that were in, in, uh, waiting for someone to pay attention to them and somehow to finance their dream, which became reality and today is a working uh, company. We also, through Oregon State, um, uh, managed to get a patent of uh, compressed natural gas, and we are providing of compressed natural gas to Florida, to all the FedEx fleet. Uh, this came also through uh, one PhD student. We are um, uh, providing it for the waste management system in all Florida. So it's grown very fast. Here I am in an opening, usually without a tie. Uh, today, I thought it was uh, a way of, I had to put one on. <laughs> and uh, our last, l l um, latest venture, we, uh, through the University of Miami, uh, are developing uh, new technology in batteries, which are based in a graphene supercapacitor. This uh, batteries can charge 50 times faster than your average battery, meaning you can charge your iPhone in one minute, will last five times more. And this technology was given to us by the US Marine Corps, since they were the first ones to develop it, and we uh, bought it for commercial purposes. Uh, this technology will be in every Tesla car starting next year, so lot cars will be lighter, will go be more efficient, and will be in all solar facilities in the world. So they will be able to storage energy and provide them at night. Because today the biggest um, challenge is that when you capture energy uh, by uh, solar facilities, you're providing it online in the day when you don't need the sun. 
but at night, when you do need it for heating purposes, lighting and all that, we will be able to do it. Um, after all, all this very intense year, which all this was 2013, um, through one of uh, my trips, I was in an airport waiting for my plane, and I encountered uh, this book. Uh, the same one I read in 1999 of Richard Branson, but uh, the newest edition. Uh, of course, I, I couldn't help but reading it again. And, um, uh, well, I realized that Richard has gone beyond himself uh, with an idea of going to space with Virgin Galactic. Uh, that appealed very much to me, so I, I realized he was now Sir Richard Branson. When I read the book, he was just Richard Branson. So I had been knighted by the Queen. He also had made some progress in life. and. Um, uh, I bought a ticket to go to space, and I had the pleasure to be invited to Necker Island, where I had the great pleasure of meeting Beth, and Mike, and Michaela, and Bruce, and that's the reason why I'm here today, so at least 90% of any applause should be for them. <laughs> and, um, and well, while in Necker, uh, I had the chance to meet incredible people like Al Gore, uh, people who were really forward into green thinking and Elon Musk and, and, and well, I became friends with Richard and I bought some piece of land, so we're neighbors now. And I couldn't resist telling him the story, that it all started by reading his book. And so I showed him the, the old edition I still kept of the 99 book, the red book, and the new one. So he couldn't resist in doing the following in giving me an autograph and insisting that I should write my own autograph. Uh, I did only on one proviso, that half of the proceedings will go to his foundation, Virgin Unite, where I'm very honored to sit in the board, and half would be um, to mine. And uh, that became a very solid friendship. Uh, he has been quite a mentor, not only about entrepreneurship, but about returning and giving back. And in a summary, it's been a, a short journey, but intense, in which it has had a lot of passion uh, in everything I've done, in uh, trying to go to a university in the US, um, in racing from the dead in 2008, in even going to space, otherwise I would have never met Richard. It has had vision to, uh, of a group, uh, to accomplish them something, to make a path, to make a plan. And it has execution, because like uh, every piece of art and everything needs to be performed by an artist and it needs to be performed by a group. And always when they ask me, I always feel like a, a conductor of the orchestra. I do very little, I just move my hands. But the, the team, uh, like you today, are the ones who really uh, share all the merits. And, well, thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. We do have time for a couple of questions. Sure. If you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you. Yes, sir. Uh, you mentioned that uh, looking at the team was one of your significant criteria in, in investing. Tell us uh, some more of the criteria that you use in, in picking the projects you invest in. Yes, of course. Um, usually, as I say, I invest in people, not companies. So for me, when I look at someone, whether it's someone I will invest in, in his company, or work with me in a team, I will always try to figure out what will happen with that person in the worst scenario. Because in the good scenario, you're just writing checks. In the bad scenario, you have to face reality. Um, someone that has uh, an average of hard skills and soft skills. We've been approached by a lot of very, very bright, talented people who are very, um, uh, maybe they have something great in their hands, but are unable to work with the rest. I always have privileged uh, working, collaborating in uh, atmospheres. And um, usually, I don't look very much at resumes. 
to be very perfectly honest. Uh, actually, I don't know where is my Stanford diploma today. It must be uh, somewhere, but I, I usually uh, ask people to tell me about their lives, what they've been through, because behind every diploma, behind every, every CV, every resume is a personal story which is even more compelling than just the words. Yes, ma'am. I, I thank you for uh, including the arts and what you were talking about in your investments and people. And today there seems to be an undermining of the arts in favor of being more utilitarian, I think, which of course there's a place for. So I would like you to just talk to us a bit about of the 78 scholarships or whatever, I assume maybe some of those have been for students in the arts. Yes. And how you make that, that case um, to all of us that it's just as important to have artists and it's not just a, a degree you throw away, but it has some value that could be useful to humanity. Of course, thank you for the question. Uh, well, um, scholarships in uh, my foundation and to speak a bit about it, probably is a little bit different than um, the regular foundation because we don't, uh, re we don't fundraise and we don't receive money from thirds, we give uh, our own. Uh, the second thing is that we award these scholarships as a full scholarship for the whole tuition. So for instance, if someone wants to pursue a, a major in arts or visual or entertainment or cinematography, we will um, commit to the full scholarship. We will provide them also a spending money for them to be able to buy books, buy food, transport, and all the basics that are need needed, and uh, at the same time, we never ask them to give their testimony unless they want to, and we never ask them to work for us or to give us back the money. So it's not a loan, it's really a gift. And to the question about arts, um, well, I think that um, art in its broader extent is everything we do, uh, not only the visual. Uh, I do believe that artists in, the, in music in visual art and uh, plastic artists are very challenged to be very um, sensitive people who are in an environment that does not produce an, a return over investment. It's a social entrepreneur in a way. Um, I do believe that uh, our foundation is very focused in balancing out. We don't want just doctors. We don't want just engineers. We want an average of that. So in our criteria, uh, even the best cause would be in, for a doctor. Uh, we wouldn't provide scholarship just for doctors. We need a little bit of everything. And, and personally, I have to say I have a personal inclination towards arts. Uh, today, uh, through Beth's generosity, we were at uh, Robin Horn's ho uh, home, and she was very, she was delightful to show us the collection and her work, and, and well, she's been fortunate to be able to do it, and we were very fortunate to be able to visit. And she supports a lot of artists. Uh, she couldn't be here today, but really, um, I have to say that it's been a long time since I haven't seen someone so devoted to her art, so giving in a very quiet way. And I think we need more people like that. Our foundation tries to do that in arts and other uh, specialties in the world. I want you to touch on um, something we talked about back there. What makes the difference between a successful entrepreneur or an enterprise and one that may not be so successful? Um, well, uh, usually the question was even harder because uh, he asked me if entrepreneurs are born or not. And that is always a hard question because uh, I do believe that we can all be, um, we can all acquire tools to, to be more successful in whatever we do. Uh, but I, I will put it in the example of people I've met, uh, people like Larry Page and Sergey Brin and Richard Branson and Elon Musk. I believe they are game changers, true entrepreneurs that are born that way. They think differently. Uh, they have a passion for what they do that goes beyond all limits. Uh, in Richard's case, even to put his own life in danger, 
in Elon Musk's case in going bankrupt after being very successful, funding his own ideas, uh, in Larry and, and Sergey, who I know closely, um, to be so committed to the company that they are not rich because they are, uh, let's say, investors. They are so rich because they never really cared about money. That's the reason why they never sold a single stock. And that's what the reason they keep it. So at the end, I think that a good entrepreneur from a great entrepreneur, it's fueled by the passion they have and being able to visualize that and being able to execute that, which sounds very basic, but at the end of the day, you really have to, to commit to get the work done and to be humble enough to know if you're not able to do it, to bring the, the best people. And that might bring people from all over the world, which is something we've encouraged in our expansion. Right in the middle. Hi, thanks so much for being here. I'm with a company that's an internationally well-known and award-winning web development company, but we won Philanthropic Company of the Year because we're very focused on what Arkansas needs to do to feed the world in terms of technology. And we are an internet company. Uh, and Arkansas, though, has brilliant entrepreneurs, Sam Walton, the Dillard, many of the, the Colsons, many others. We do have some underserved commit communities, just like Chile and, and Santiago has, has wealthy and, and many less. My question to you is, where can we look to get a better public-private partnership in funding the internet? Because everything we've talked about today is really going to be core to whether a child has connectivity in the future. If they can reach an artist, if they can publish their art, if they can learn Richard's story, that lives and breathes storytelling, art, and, and intellect through the internet. And that, that's where our focus has become reaching underserved Delta communities and others. And I'm curious, who else have you seen do an amazing job? Well, um, I think that Arkansas would be the, the ultimate example of extreme wealth and extreme poverty in the same um, state. Um, we were with some students who were doing some work, out, work on um, how many uh, p students from a Latino background community would have an interest to go to school, and that was, it was appalling because it was less than half. And uh, behind that, I think there's a reality in which uh, there's, of course, means of wealth, uh, and the Waltons hold a, a world record. Um, and there's also means of need. Uh, I think that uh, people who have done a great job in what you are asking is Nicolas uh, Negroponte of MIT. He has developed a very inexpensive computer that is being uh, distributed around um, different countries, including the US. Uh, it's something you apply directly to the MIT, and they will provide you. Uh, of course, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, which is one of the biggest, it's the biggest in the world, without a doubt. Uh, no question there. And uh, they have a huge endowment. But then, I, I do think that uh, like I said to the students uh, here, when we're faced with need of our neighbor, it seems obvious to me that instead of calling the richest one in another country, county, people should act together and put together something for that community. In my case, uh, my little contribution has been education because I believe in it, and it did a whole difference for me. Um, I do believe that for the internet, for arts, and for what you're, you're speaking about, I do believe that Little Rock and Arkansas being today in everyone's mental map, thanks to Bill Clinton, uh, has been, uh, can, can produce uh, a lot of awareness on I do think that within this probably room, there are enough resources to address that certain point. But I think it has to begin uh, by, by touching home. Uh, I'm usually approached by a lot of people who, who somehow want um, um, to have a certain ideas or contacts with people. 
And I usually tell them that the, the, what, what you are explaining has so much power when you are the one, the first one who starts donating, producing, because then, as we say in business, you can walk the talk. And I think that that stands very true in life and in business too. We have time for one more, Hatim. Good evening, thank you for coming. Thank you. You mentioned you work with a lot of PhDs through the entrepreneurships that you're doing. Um, and with the education system you know, in the US, and there's, I think, less and less of people going into engineering degrees and things like that. Are you f having to go outside the US to other universities in Asia and Europe and Africa to find a more competitive you know, environment? Or is it just that the establishments here, which were brought originally from Morocco, and I came here for the education, and so, it's still here, it's the country that brings a lot of minds here and that's, that's why they're still focused on US universities versus others throughout the world. Yes, uh, well, it holds very true. Um, actually, the gentleman that invented uh, the super capacitor of graphene is Chinese. He comes from the University of Beijing, was contracted by the US Marine Corps and since the base is in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, uh, they had to do it in the University of Miami. So then again, it holds very true. It attracts, the education system attracts the brightest mind of the world, given its resources, given its connectivity. Um, I do think also that there are places everywhere where you can tap a great idea. Some people say, uh, there's money there is, there isn't uh, a lot of opportunities where to invest. I would defer from that because I think there are great opportunities to invest. The thing is, it's not a bond, it's not shares, it's not a mutual fund, it's something far beyond. And uh, it's not only PhD students. Actually, the first one I invested in dropped out from Stanford, didn't complete the PhD. I don't think he regrets it very much, but um, he has done okay. But uh, at, at the end, I do think that uh, in any stage of life, you meet people from all over. The reason why we tried to expand was one, because the more we diversify, the less the risk of our corporation. So we are never caught in a global event since we are uh, in, in several countries. But then because talent is elsewhere sometimes. For instance, in Australia, Google Maps was invested in Australia, the black box in Australia, the cochlear implant in Australia, the solar uh, film in Australia. And there are so many things I cannot recall now that were invested, invented in Australia. We could be talking for another hour. The thing is, in, in Australia, people are very relaxed and are, they're not, they don't aspire to be in Forbes or Fortune. They make the company and then they sell it for a lesser price. They favor going surfing, and it's a great quality of life. It's been forecast by The Economist uh, many times, so it holds three of the best uh, cities where you live. But uh, people are very happy with making a few other dollars, spending time with family, and then this gets sold in the US for an incredible amount. Uh, probably the best scenario uh, would be WhatsApp, uh, who everyone knows. Um, I never again invested in a dot-com, uh, to be perfectly honest. I always invested after Google in solid things for one reason, which was statistics mostly, which is the only subject in, in, I, I was good at or sort of good at in university. I thought the chance of, of lightning to strike twice at the same time would be impossible. <laughs> so after I got Google, I said, okay, I'm off the dot-coms and I'll invest in real things. And I believe in investing in real things and real people. Well, Bartel, thank you so much for coming to Tallulah.